From Redox and Healthcare Strategy Bullpen, welcome to Diagnosing Health Tech. Good morning, Health Tech. I am Jeff Englander, the founder and principal of Healthcare Strategy Bullpen, and uh, you are watching Diagnosing Health Tech. So uh, I want to welcome everybody. Uh, we are back with a full week. Um, and this week, I am joined by my guest, Carolyn Brinkerhoff from Redox. And Carolyn, I'm going to let you introduce our guest since you two have a long history together. Yes. Hey, everybody. I'm Carolyn. Um, I am so excited to introduce um, Marty, <laughs> ugh, Marty Bomjan. Um, he and I go very, very far back. We were just talking about it. We work together um, at a large health system almost 10 years ago. Um, and way back when him and I um, worked really closely on things like preparing for downtimes, um, failover practices, anything around deploying client systems. I learned so much from him during that time. Um, now, Marty focuses on healthcare incident response to cyber threats and uh, clinical continuity to ensure healthcare systems will always have the technology available and capabilities to deliver trusted patient care. Um, Marty has led countless health systems through major incident management and um, cyber incident response during ransomware events, um, network breaches, and dealing with threat actors to healthcare IT systems. Um, he knows so much. I love learning from him, and I'm just really thrilled that we get to have a, a conversation with him today about all that's going on in cybersecurity. Good morning, Marty. Uh, Marty, can you tell us a little bit about um, yourself? Uh, you know, in terms of your background. Um, you know, what Carolyn didn't cover from your your heyday together, and also from you know what your role is at CDW. Yeah, yeah. I definitely cost Carolyn to age at least 10 years, by the way. <laughs> yeah, I've um, yeah, been in healthcare 15 years prior uh, Department of Defense, um, really focusing on EMR implementation, cybersecurity, everything latest and greatest cyber related. Um, day to day, I spend half my time with customers and healthcare systems, just going through risk assessments, implementations, technology, and then the other half, really focusing on what policies out there right? What's going to impact healthcare, uh, whether it's good or bad. Um, always here for a fun time. So, And you, you're, you talk about what are the latest policies out there. There are some big things in the news right now. One of, the, one of which is what's happening in the state of New York around policies around cybersecurity. Explain like I'm five, what's going on. Um, give us a high level overview and we can dig in a little bit more. And how, does, and how will this impact the, the greater country too? Yeah, yeah. So, so the state last year, um, around November, had to release initial papers to say that there's going to be new regulation, um, and the direct target of that is healthcare and protecting the consumer. Right? Uh, if you kind of read through the 90 pages, it looks like it's not written by any CISOs in healthcare or anybody clinical in healthcare. It's really state regulators, right, and lawmakers that based their kind of application of it based off what the SEC is doing publicly right now. Um, and they kind of give you eight bullet points when you read through the whole thing. Mainly it's things everybody's doing already, right? Conduct an annual risk assessment. Who doesn't do that? Every CISO and CIO is dealing with that through the cyber insurance and protecting their clinicians and their patients. Um, not only that was a information that says you have to designate a CISO. I don't know any New York hospitals or healthcare systems that don't have a chief information security officer. Everybody really has one and they're, you know, they really point out they have to oversee cyber policy and security operations. Well, that, that's what they're doing. Um, the big one was you have to document and implement an incident response plan. Uh, that one is interesting because the Joint Commission really started pushing that July three years ago now. Uh, most healthcare systems have their documented policies and get are getting better at it. I think the gotchas are, what do they really mean by implement and practice? Because there's very loose guidelines around that, right? And then ensuring MFA, everybody has MFA turned on. Um, hopefully they should actually have MFA turned on. I don't wanna say everybody. Um, the, some of the big ones are, they do call out, you have to implement procedures to make sure externally developed applications are secure, right? You have to get a security bill of material. It is the CISO's responsibility and the onus is on them. 
Um, that one's interesting. We've had a lot of discussions with peers in the industry trying to figure out what does that really mean? Because every cloud vendor is different. Healthcare has embraced the cloud at this point. So now is it, you know, our responsibility to make sure that the solutions are secure that we're buying? Is it the vendor we're buying from and something goes south, who's really in trouble and responsible for that? Um, and the big one is notifications, right? That one's getting a lot of pushback where the state is saying, and lawmakers are saying, if there's an event that occurs, you have two hours to notify the state. Well, generally it takes six to eight hours to figure out what's really going on when you start doing forensics, right? It's nearly impossible to set up notifications in two hours. Who do you notify? What information do you share? And what are the penalties if you don't? So, and the assumption is, you know, New York's very progressive. They go first. You know, we follow them in California. And then everybody else does in the Northeast and then the West Coast. So. So, Marty, can you, you know, further elaborate on that and talk about what this means for hospitals in terms of extra costs? Um, and I know the state allocated, I think, about $500 million to help hospitals with this transition. But, you know, there's tremendous cost in all of these things they're prescribing, and particularly the ones that are more, and, you know, maybe elaborate more, on where the law is more prescriptive than HIPAA. Cost-wise, look, $500 million is not that much if you look at the size and the population of New York and the healthcare systems of New York, right? We, we learned in the pandemic, a lot of the money that existed went to healthcare systems that have really good grant writers that are on top of their game versus having those get funneled to critical access hospitals. And if you divide up the number of physical entities in New York and hospitals, it's really not that much money to even make a dent. Yeah. Um, and some of the requirements in there, um, my peer Nelson and I were talking about this and, it, and with some customers in New York, and the discussion was, do I really need to keep six years of logs of everything that happens in my healthcare system that costs tens of millions of dollars, right? And now you look at you look at it two ways where it gives the CISO and cybersecurity firepower to say, hey, I got to follow policy and regulation, so we have to go buy this. But at the same time, that money might be spent better in other places. What about, um, I also know, and, and then Carolyn, I'll throw it back to you, I also know that you know the law requires annual penetration testing and also identification of you know certain cybersecurity vulnerabilities that are out there, and this is is more prescriptive than what's in HIPAA. And you know, is there kind of a thinking that you know maybe we just you know pay the fine on some of these? And and so if you, you could talk about both of those things. Yes and no. M most organizations I know are doing annual pen tests, right? Cyber insurance okay. requires. There, and it, it's just good hygiene to do that anyway, to figure out what vulnerabilities you have and go through remediation. Um, the downside of that is it, the regulation is really not that clear on what you have to disclose as a result of that pen test, right? There could be critical information. Say if I was a healthcare system, I do a pen test. Generally, I'm not gonna disclose anything, right? Until I remediate the findings. But if there's any kind of forced disclosure on that, the public gets access to and so they're threat actors, right? We don't want the yeah. bad guys to have that information. And and penalties are really not that clearly defined yet. I Marty, see, I will, go, go ahead, go ahead, Carolyn. My, I'm curious around, this came out recently, end of last year, right? When are the, when is the, when will this start being enforced? And what's the gap between how many new processes need to be in place? How many, what, like new um, resources need to be allocated for this in order, like what what is the, how realistic is it for health systems and to be to be able to implement these changes by the due date or do you think there's gonna be some kind of gap? Technically still on now, right? Oh, wow. They released an initial pa paper in November and now it's going into places of J January 1st and kind of the thought process is by end of year have the requirements in place, right? The big questions are, Who's actually going to show up and audit this, right? Carolyn, you're the CEO of a healthcare system and I'm a lawmaker. I'm not going to just show up at your door. It's not like the joint commission coming in and unannounced. Um, and the thought process is translating what the law actually is putting in definition. And do I have something that does this already or do I have to go buy something that does it? Yeah. I, I think it'll be 
kind of telling if there ever is an audit or an event for a healthcare system that causes lawmakers and regulatory to come in and say, hey, this happened and it's the law, right? Here's the fines. So, so let me go. We already have a couple of questions. And, and Carolyn, I'll take the first one if you don't mind taking the second one. So the first one uh, is from Art. Art, thank you. And it's a little long, so bear with me while I ask this, folks. Um, how real is the damage from a cyber attack on a healthcare provider? Like we hear a lot about Scripps or a random hospital in Michigan got hit. Patient data was exposed or stolen, but we never hear anything more about how much damage was actually caused. Uh, like our senior executives starting to say, it's not as damaging to our business as we um, don't have to plan to fortify, bear with me, fortify ourselves uh, as much. So can you try to address that? I guess the, the, the question is, is it the, uh, is it the uh, exposure of an attack or is the actual damage and what has the actual damages been in some of these cases? Have the actual damages been in some of these cases? Generally all of the above, right? We, when we do incident response, we don't share any information externally outside of that healthcare system, cyber insurance and legal and general counsel. Um, but you, you look around, the real damage is during the downtime, patients not getting their access, right? Healthcare systems going on diversion, the revenue loss, the brand damage that's there, and all of that builds up into hundreds of millions of dollars. The real problem is the, not just the financial cost of it, right? Healthcare systems will recoup that. The damage is patients not getting the access that they need, especially if the emergency room, the ICU, the NICU, all of that is offline. And you get these extended downtimes that go into 20, 30, 40 days. That's where the real damage is. And at the same time, it's putting pressure on neighboring healthcare systems at the end of the day. Interesting. Uh, Carolyn, do you want to take the second one? Yeah, Marty, uh, a comment is asking um, for you to see, or question on what perspective you have on this comment. Um, cyber attacks are due to password attacks. 15 billion are stolen and on the dark web, 80% of cyber attacks are stolen through password entry. Is that something that you see in your work today? Um, any thoughts there? Yeah, almost every, major, almost every major breach and event that occurs is due to bad hygiene and honestly, people using the same password that they do for social media and MFA bypass, right? Password sprays still work. Kind of to his point, there was a recent share of information that the amount of passwords that were stolen in aggregate over the last five years were published in the dark web. Bad actors got access to it. And what are they going to do? They're going to release bots to go try to log in to a patient portal, employee portal, Citrix front access, Office 365, and hopefully most organizations have MFA enabled, right? But the problem is people make exceptions, right? Somebody complains enough, they get an exception and that one password for that individual user, if their corporate password is the same as social media password, it's probably out there at the end of the day. Yeah, uh, so we have another one and, and Marty, you are going fast and furious on the questions here. So um, uh, this one is from Shelly and Shelly, thank you. How helpful are AI and ML in fighting cyber attacks? Or are AI and ML more damaging than helpful to healthcare organizations as they can be additional weapons for bad actors? Number one on the list, bad actors are gonna weaponize it, right? They already have. Early last year, we saw ransomware malware payloads that were actually put together and compiled uh, using very basic, I don't wanna say names, but chat-based AI engines. Um, at the same time, we're seeing a lot of cybersecurity solutions providers actually implement AI and machine learning into their heuristics and just doing better threat detection. And 50% of it is really just marketing, right? AI is still very immature. Yeah. Um, well, thank you. Thank you, folks. Keep the questions coming. And Carolyn, do you want to uh, go ahead and ask... Um, you know, Marty, uh, you know, a little bit about, you know, because I know you have, you guys have a deep history and in incident response and emergency preparedness. And I you know you have some other questions. Yeah, sure. Well, I will get through all of my questions as we, um, but we're always, always welcoming questions in the chat. So feel free to keep asking. So Marty, um, let's talk clinical continuity. Um, what are some critical elements that healthcare organizations should consider um, to ensure an un uninterrupted patient care during and after a cyber incident? At downtime preparedness, right? I mean, 
you and I have worked on this together over the years. It, it's most clinical staff know what to do when the EMR and the network's not available, right? It's they do plan downtimes anyway in the middle of the night for the EMR, probably once a quarter on a late Sunday night, so the night shift knows what to do. They don't need downtime documentation. They go on autopilot. Um, what we notice is during major cyber events, it's usually during a holiday and limited staff. Uh, downtime is extremely delayed because the staff doesn't go through tabletop exercises to deal with the cyber threat. They go through tabletop exercises for earthquake, fire, disaster, power loss, right? Um, clinic operations generally knows what to do. I think the problem that we've caused in the last five years on the IT operations side is we've done a really good job implementing technology in our downtime process, right? We have downtime PCs, we have all the communication tools they need, and most of that stuff is on the network, which cyber attacks are impacting that now. So the expectation is don't rely on your downtime process and your downtime PCs and your downtime documentation if it's on your network. Um, plus, it's we have some seasoned veteran clinicians out there and nurses and doctors that kind of were born and raised in the era of not having the modern EMR and access to an EMR everywhere. So they generally know what to do, but you look at my generation of people, we go to med school and any kind of clinical training is done on Epic Center or Meditech. That's what we're used to, right? You take that away, it can complete panic at the end of the day. And also biomed's the big part people don't really think about. A lot of healthcare systems have telesitters now, right? Telesitters rely on the network. Telesitters are a force multiplier for bedside staff and clinical staff. That goes offline and you take that away. You have to have your nurses and your bedside staff to go sit next to a patient. And there's just not enough of them. And those are things to really think about of how do you handle that in a major cyber event, especially if it's an extended downtime. So, um, uh, and Jose, thank you uh, for your questions. Jose, I know you are quite steeped in a lot of this and, um, you know, we want to let everybody get their questions in here. So feel free to, you know, we can connect offline. Um, I know you have your own company in this area, so happy to, happy to do that. Uh, we do have another question from Shelly, but before we do that, I did want to go back to something you said before, Marty, in terms of moving to the cloud and you know can you talk about you know how healthcare was typically an area that didn't always embrace the cloud was not quick to the cloud but since the pandemic has really embraced the cloud and what are the advantages of, of moving to the cloud particularly in cybersecurity? yeah yeah so i mean the red tape went away magically in the pandemic let's start there All right historically it would take years to make a decision on do we take what we currently have on-prem and yeah. move a specific function or system to the cloud? It will take years of debate, discussion, go through CapEx and OpEx, all the stuff that we have to, to prove to CFO it's worth doing. That disappeared. The red tape just went away. Um, at the same time, what that is introducing is one, a lot of solution vendors out there are cloud first now, right? It's really your only choice is going to the cloud. Um, that really, reduces the operational burden on IT staff and it can increase your demand on cybersecurity because it's supposed to be shared responsibility, which different people interpret shared responsibility as, hey, it's the cloud vendor that I'm buying from if it's SaaS, if it's IaaS, it's my problem at the CISO. Um, what that's really changing right now is historically cybersecurity focused on let's protect the infrastructure. Let's protect all the access points to my network in my data centers on premises. Now I have to protect that, all the access points to my cloud vendors and all of my users who are remote at the same exact time. And healthcare has embraced the cloud, right? And it introduces resilience at the end of the day. Now I don't have to buy two of everything for my data centers. I just have to go pay a vendor to say, you know, if you're secure, if you're resilient, if I need less hands-on management and hopefully it costs me the same or less, I'm going to go to cloud first. And, you know, in terms of cloud first, it is, do you see um, an advantage or preference to going all public cloud or hybrid? Um, and, you know, uh, is, is there any specific, you know, route you would take there? I don't think there's a direct answer for that. It's my take on it is if I can do SaaS, 
if I can reduce infrastructure, I don't have to buy compute storage, all the cybersecurity tools to wrap around that. SaaS makes sense, right? If it financially makes sense. Um, IaaS is a whole different game because in healthcare, Carolyn, I know <laughs> that we've dealt with over and over, not every application, especially legacy applications built, can go to the cloud. And right. that's where really IaaS makes sense. Instead of putting a server on-prem, I'm going to go put in the cloud, stand up the network, and I'm going to secure the environment. The downside of that is really what we're seeing is my problem is no longer the on-prem security controls that are applied in my data center, in my access and entry points. I have to do that, plus I have to apply that to my public cloud vendor, right? And private cloud is really less and less existent now. It's we have the major cloud providers. They all do a really, really good job. And it's becoming so my tax surface has significantly increased with all the cloud presence, all the data that's going everywhere in the cloud, because we like to duct tape everything to everything in healthcare for data exchange. And on top of that, I have to be responsible to secure all of it, right? And report on all of it. That's that's great. And I and I love the term duct tape, that is so appropriate. Uh, we are really good at making everything talk to everything in healthcare, right? Yeah. Like, you Go ahead, Marty. I'm sorry. No, I just like that, that healthcare industry is so good at information exchange. As much as everybody complains about it, that's what we're good at, right? And we've historically made every system talk to every system for kind of the sake of patient care and revenue cycle and data exchange. Now. 10 years of doing that, everyone's trying to unwind it and standardize on it, right? And secure it. And that's where cloud really introduces simplifying that and centralizing it. But at the same time, you're putting all of your eggs in one basket. Yeah. Carolyn? So Marty, with um, the increasing adoption of all of these cloud-based solutions in healthcare IT, how has that impacted your general cybersecurity and business continuity strategies? What are the new challenges that healthcare organizations should be aware of as they make this transition? It, it simplified end user adoption and experience and operational maintenance. I don't have to buy two of everything for the data centers. I don't have to figure out my own resiliency to have a DR system where I can just pass it off to a SaaS vendor, right? And say, hey, I'm paying for it. You're responsible for uptime whenever I need it. Um, the downside is, due diligence for cybersecurity. Not every, there's a lot of startups and vendors in healthcare space and they're doing really cool stuff, right? We're seeing a lot of AI and ML adoption that was brought up earlier. Um, not everybody has a security bill of material. Not everybody has the same money and the security controls in place when it's a cloud vendor and that's really falling on the CISO because clinical leadership wants it, makes their life easier. At the same time, the CISO, the CIO, the CTO are responsible for availability and security of it which can be challenging at times. And my recommendation is always be skeptical, right? When you go into bringing a new cloud system into place, it just because somebody checked off a box in an assessment that says they have all the controls applied, it might not always be true because things change and you're at the mercy of the cloud vendor. Right. It, 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 talk to us about, you know, we're, we're um you know talking about security and the cloud and how you secure and when you say be skeptical obviously you you've done this a number of times um what exactly are you or what areas have you found where you need to be the most skeptical really when you go to a vendor or a partner or any startup anybody that's storing any type of data in the cloud it's ask the right questions. Make sure you're asking all the right legal questions and compliance questions. Now, now when you, you know, that, that's kind of what I mean. When you say ask the right questions, what are some of those right questions? Go beyond just asking, do you have these controls applied? And it's show me the controls that you have applied. I want to see how your systems function. Okay. Because at the end of the day, it's I'm not just signing a piece of paper saying I'm offloading my, you know, patient data for some AI technology that's sitting and a cloud partner, it's show me how you're securing that data, how you're encrypting it, how often are you checking these controls that are in place. Back to the pen test, how often are you really doing a pen test and are you gonna disclose the results to me as a customer or are you gonna fix it and how fast are you gonna fix that? And then also availability. The big discussion always was, 
hey, if I go to the cloud, I want full uptime. That's what I'm paying for. And we kind of forgot the cybersecurity aspect of that because we're promoting the user experience. Now it's availability and security at the same time, right? And how often do you do maintenance? How often do you do code updates? Do you have any type of cyber solutions actually monitoring the code that you're releasing? Right. Now, now kind of pulling these two things together, you're, we were, we've been talking about the cloud and earlier you mentioned if you have, um, you know, telesitters, um, you know, Shelly's asking uh, with respect, kind of an extension of telesitters moving into RPM and, and just for you folks out there, we will be releasing a report with Redox on the remote patient monitoring uh, industry and we'll have a webinar coming up in early February. So please do stay tuned for that. Um, but Shelly is asking, in terms of cybersecurity risk, how do hospital at home programs introduce additional cybersecurity risks? What risks can healthcare organizations put in place to reduce those risks? Attack surface increase. I have no idea what anybody has in their house or what's on their network, period. There is a lot of amazing technology out there for RPM right now. So healthcare systems can monitor their patients and really bring them back into brick and mortar before the patient needs to know they have to be there, right? But at the same time, whatever device I'm sending home for them or whatever magical device they have on their wrist is on a network somewhere talking to other devices. And now the responsibility is, does the CISO and cybersecurity have to secure the network at somebody else's house? No, probably not. They shouldn't, it's not their responsibility. But those devices are talking back to my network, to my cloud, and they're touching my EMR, right? They're touching my data exchange system. They're touching my integration engine. And what's in between? It's the internet. So Wild West, nobody knows what's there. Right. At the same time, we can't say no because there's a shortage of staff, right? RPM is taking off and it's here to stay. In that respect, do you have a uh, preference or do you just this is this, you know one of the things we've been dealing with in the report? Do you have a preference or do you see a security issue with, you know, wireless versus, you know, broadband? Um, you know, uh, there's a there's a debate, you know, do you and now even there's, you know, there's now fixed wireless coming into play. Any thoughts on that? My take on it is it's all the same. It's all a network. If a network exists, it's not secure, period. Right. It, it's zero trust mentality. It, we implemented zero trust 15 years ago in the Department of Defense. It works, right? Healthcare is implementing it. Finance is implementing it. Everybody in transportation is implementing it. And I've seen some CISOs do it really well, where they say, if a remote patient monitoring device is going home, it is owned by the healthcare system. I'm going to put my remote monitoring agents on that on the cybersecurity side and make sure that vulnerability is always patched. I know where that device is. I know who's accessing that device. I know how it's accessing my network. Versus other organizations take the stance of, hey, we're going to you know, let you bring your own device. And the way that information is going to be exchanged is going to be extremely scrutinized and that information gets dumped somewhere and the healthcare system actually pulls it, making sure that, you know, it's air gap and firewall doesn't mean that the data is scrutinized, data accuracy, integrity is there, but at a very expensive price, right? Yeah. Do I do that or do I spend the money on upgrading my EMR to make life easy? Yeah. Go ahead, Carolyn. I know you're, you've been waiting very patiently. Thank you. Oh, all right. Uh, maybe a tricky one for you, Marty. Um, what role does data protection play in maintaining trust? And how do you advise healthcare organizations on securely integrating and maintaining that sensitive patient data? I say go see the data folks because they'll have a much better answer than I will. <laughs> um, it, it's a complex question. We, as an industry, collect so much data, right? All the patient telemetry, patient identity, like PII is there to stay, all the billing information. And every person in the United States is a patient of a healthcare system and their information is sitting there. That's what the bad guys want. The threat actors and the bad actors want to get their access on that data so they can commit credit card fraud, right? Or credit fraud or just identity theft. At the same time, we have to protect all that data and the patient information. So I, I think historically, everybody looked at it as, let me go find the data, you know, put definitions around the data, figure out what I have to secure, create a data warehouse where all my data sits, and I know the data integrity is there. Nearly impossible to do, right? Everybody tried, and I can only think of a couple of healthcare systems that have done that very, very successfully at an extremely high price. 
And the big gotcha, I think, is consumers are becoming more aware. The TJX event happened years and years ago. That was a really big one. And then we saw the same thing happen to healthcare systems where data is exfiltrated as patient information. Um, there was a recent uh, article for an event that happened in um, Washington State where the bad actors came out and they had data exfiltration. They found a bunch of patient information. Generally, it's not the EMR they're getting it out of. It's all the exported data that they're getting their hands on for you know, spreadsheets and Excel documents. Um, and the threat that they made was you either pay the ransom or I'm going to go after all the patients and I'm going to go commit credit fraud and I'm going to target them and I'm going to go dox those patients. And that's where things are changing, right? What does healthcare do now? What do healthcare systems do say? I'm never going to let my data get out or I'm not going to share that information. Or is it pushing back and saying, okay, I'm going to share this information, but like everybody who touches it is responsible for security. And at the end of the day, patients don't really sue healthcare systems for their data being stolen, right? It's usually a class action lawsuit that takes years and years and we get amnesia and we forget. Mm -hmm. So Marty, with respect to that, in terms of, you know, new operability standards and, um, you know, all of these things, as, as people are looking to, you know, share more data, as it's looking to become more standardized, are there certain, you know, specific things, you know, as, as you mentioned, there's a, you know, broader playing field or, you know, your, your threat canvas is much bigger. Are there certain things in terms of like we had this when I was at Capital One, we had the configuration issue with the cloud. Um, are there certain things you want to look for in, in, in your vendors in, similar to what you alluded to, like when you're talking about the big three cloud providers? Uh, platform based consolidation, right? If I work with a customer, or in my previous position as CTO, it's, I'm not gonna go buy a tool because somebody wants it. I'm gonna go to a big vendor that has platform-based consolidation that if I'm gonna send them any data or any information, I know they have the money and the resources to have the right cybersecurity controls in place and they're gonna keep up with it. So instead of buying a couple of tools from three or four different vendors, I'm gonna go to one right. vendor and say, hey, show me your platform and I wanna get you know, maximum use out of it. And I want to see all the security controls in that platform. Downside of that, they don't innovate, right? The innovators are the small startups that are really making a big difference in healthcare right now. And what about, what about vendor lock-in in that situation? What do you mean? If you, if you, you go and you, you work with a single vendor because of, you know, you're talking about platform consolidation, but then you're locked into either you know, Azure or AWS or, you know, w w w is that a bigger risk? I don't know that it's a bigger risk. It's a bigger financial risk, not a cybersecurity risk. Right? Okay. A shared responsibility. If I lock into a single vendor, I'm stuck with them for three to five years, right? Some bigger organizations go multi-cloud and multi-vendor to prevent that lock-in. Um, at the same time, the risk is what if you don't, right? What if yeah. you end up going multi-cloud and now you're responsible for security of AWS, GCP, and Azure at the same time, and you don't have the in-house expertise to do all three? Yeah, that makes sense. I see we got a little bit of a backup on some questions. Carolyn, do you want to take Art's question? Yeah, let's see. Um, it's it's a little long, so bear with me. Um, I believe a SolarWinds executive is being held responsible in part effectively for a dereliction of duty relative to that attack and an overall lack of oversight and preparedness for such an attack. How much does this impact senior leaders moving forward in terms of, I just lost it, their investment of time and tools to ensure they're not going to be held accountable in the SolarWinds executive way? Solar wins everybody and all of my peers are watching right now because the SEC came out and directly named the CISO and pretty much said, you're responsible for this, right? You attested that your environment was secure, that your data was secure, and you knew about vulnerabilities that existed that should have been fixed years ago and you turned a blind eye. Never happened before in the history of the commercial market. So now CISOs are waiting to see what are the real results of that because is a CISO actually responsible for it or is the organization responsible? Because at the same time, the take on that was every CISO says, hey, go give me money. I can do X, Y, and Z and reduce risk. 
and you go through a risk matrix and probability calculation, and you say, if I invest this money, I'm a little more secure. Somebody in finance comes back and says, well, I might take the chance because I don't want to, I don't know why you're laughing, Jeff. I'm not going to give Jeff $50 million for that one extra percentage of security. I was the finance guy. That's why I'm laughing. (laughs) Right. And and this is interesting because now is the responsibility, the responsibility is on the CISO, right? Nobody wakes up in the morning and says, I'm going to go be CISO of a healthcare system or, you know, JP Morgan Chase or somewhere else. And they're happy about that job. They're taking on a very difficult job. And now we added the layer of, hey, if you make a mistake, whether you knew about it or not, you're responsible for it. No one's going to want to go into cybersecurity, period. Yeah. So let me ask you, there's a question from Michelle, um, which I'll take here. Um, and bear with us, Shelly. We're going to try to get a mix of questions in here. So Michelle asks, with increased dependence on third parties, I'm assuming she means the, the cloud providers, I have to assume there's an increased risk of alignment with business objectives as it relates to poor decisions, exposure gaps, et cetera. Um, so I wonder if you can uh, you know, talk about that a little bit, Marty. It's not just an increased dependency on third parties. Clinical operations, revenue cycle, HR, everybody wants the shiny new tool that's out there because it makes their job easier, right? And cybersecurity historically would get in the way of that. It, now we're seeing organizations work better together because their business objective is to stay in business and provide patient care. That's the goal of a healthcare system, or it should be anyway, right? So there is always gonna be an increased risk in alignment. It is definitely getting better. And this comes back to pick your partners and vendors wisely, make sure they have a security bill of material, standardize on reviewing that, and educate business partners, right? The well, the really good CISOs out there are at the table when it comes to these business decisions with any of the operational leaders and the business leaders, instead of being last in line when a decision is made to move to a third-party vendor. And also every third-party vendor is cloud-based at this point, almost all of them, right? So, so, go ahead, Marty, go finish up, I apologize. Uh, apply the same security principles as you would on-prem. At the end of the day, so, I want to ask one follow-up question and I'll let you get back in here. So Marty, you know, one of the things we pride ourselves on and we talk about is is taking people away from what you just mentioned, which is the bright, shiny object. Um, And, you know, our experience has been is you really have to kind of peel the onion back and, you know, get them back to, you know, what is it you're trying to do? How are you trying to do this? How does it fit with your stack, your technology stack? How does it fit with your culture? Um, so I'm wondering if you've had that same experience or what kinds of things you end up seeing you have to walk people through, you know, as you kind of get them away from going to the bright, shiny object in technology to what you think is a really a better solution. I, I think it's showing them and involving those business leaders and the decision makers in the cybersecurity conversations, mm-hmm. right? That, that I think works a lot better. If my CNO or CMIO wants something or my CMO wants something to make clinical care better for their clinicians and make their life easier, if I'm talking to a vendor or a partner, I'm going to involve them in the conversation so they see the questions I'm asking and try to explain why we're asking those questions. So they understand what the risk is, not for them, but for the healthcare system and the patients at the end of the day. Right. Okay, right. Go. Yeah, let's hop back to Shelly's question. Um, Marty, what's your perspective on blockchain for healthcare? Um, do you expect it to gain traction in the industry as a more secure alternative for data exchange? I, I think blockchain is here to stay. The technology has been proven. It works pretty well. Um, but blockchain for finance makes sense. It's really good to hide things using blockchain in a wallet, right? Um, that's why ransomware games love blockchain when it comes to money exchange. Um, I I don't know if it's here to gain traction. I don't know if it's here to really grow or shrink. Um, I think it's a viable solution for managing exportable patient health information. Because now, if patients are educated enough to say, I'm going to go take my charting information, my historical information on my patient data into a blockchain wallet and take it with me, they're going to have it on their phone anywhere they go. And that technology will probably start taking off a little bit. It just comes to adoption because everyone's going to scrutinize it, right? At the end of the day, if somebody takes my data and puts it in a wallet somewhere, is it the healthcare system that's responsible or is the consumer that did that? 
go ahead, Carolyn. I know I've, I've been talking a lot, and uh, we you know, Marty has been uh, wonderful. So, so go ahead. I know. Had a lot of coffee. We're Very coming. Up, here's the plan. We're coming towards the end of our product podcast. We got a, we got a few more minutes left. Um, I am going to pepper you with some general learnings questions to see what can, what can you how can you help this audience? How can you help better educate us around cybersecurity? How can you better educate health organizations? Let's start with the first one. How can organizations strike that balance between accessibility and security, especially when data is in flight um, and needs to be readily readily available and should be highly protected? We spent billions of dollars on implementing modern EMRs and cybersecurity was not front of mind at the time when it should have been, right? Now we're implementing a lot of security solutions around that for all the remote users and the on-prem users and everybody moving around that's causing friction. I, I think it's really the biggest challenge there is education. One, we always say, hey, let's go teach everybody else cybersecurity. Why don't we eat our own dog food as cybersecurity and go shadow the clinicians and the operations people? to see how difficult their job actually is, right? That needs to happen way more than it does. Awesome. Can, can I just stick w w one quick follow-up in here, Caroline? Yeah, for sure. You know, one of the things you always see in these policies is there's this long list of draconian policies and, and you're going to be taken out and tarred and feathered if you violate this. <laughs> how do you build in the um, ability for someone who makes a mistake or accidentally or on purpose just really quickly throws a flash drive in somewhere if you even some places even if you can even still do that and and does something and and allow them to be vulnerable and come to you and say hey i did this and i shouldn't have i made a mistake here's what happened so you can nip that security incident in the butt how do you give that clinician or that administrator the vulnerability to do that and it, and still maintain those cybersecurity principles that's the exceptions thing most breaches that occur are due to an exception that's made somewhere especially because of a, a, any clinician or researcher that's really vocal on social media becomes an easy target, right? The people know right. that they have data, the bad actors know they have the information that they want to get their hands on because that's how they can make a ransom threat. At the same time, don't give them the ability to do that. Give them tools that they can do it without plugging in a USB drive, right? This comes back to go talk to them instead of saying, I'm not doing that. Go talk to the researchers and the clinical people. Go shadow them and follow them around for eight hours to see what they're doing all day long. And once I think security understands their workflows better, we can become a lot more helpful instead of just saying no. Great, go ahead, Carolyn. I, I, along, alongside that question, um, what are the biggest mistakes organizations are still making when it comes to cybersecurity? Buying more stuff isn't always good. This comes back to the platform-based play. The more you buy, the more you have to manage and the more complex it is, and again, you know, on cybersecurity too, we make everything talk to everything, just like we do in the clinical operations side and the EMR analyst side, right? Um, go to platform-based consolidation. And the other big one is listening to really understand from the business, what are they trying to do and what are their business plans and go get them the tools ahead of time instead of being last in line when a major clinical or business decision is made to bring on a partner. Got That's it. great. All right, my last question. I don't know. I have no promises if Jeff will have more. Um, but to tie it all up together, given the evolving nature of cybersecurity threats, how do you stay informed about the latest technologies to better assist healthcare organizations in protecting themselves? Um, my take on it is the community, right? Don't believe every article you read on the internet, right? There's bad people out there. <laughs> and all the information, you read, people read information about breaches that occurred they're rarely actually accurate or true because legal is never going to allow anybody to publish anything, right? Um, it, it's build a relationship with CIOs and CISOs and CMIOs and everybody else that's out there to get people's perspective. And when it comes to technology vendors, don't just look through PowerPoint or a podcast and say, hey, yeah, that looks great. Let's go do that. Hey, hey easy on the podcast comments there. Your yeah. podcast is great, by the way. One of my favorite ones. Um, Go, go ask, right? Don't just say, sh like, don't just agree that it looks good. Go ask and trust but verify at the same time. Tell them to show you. Show me how secure it is. Show me how interoperability works on your end. Show me what third-party vendors you have as my vendor in place. So, Marty, uh, and I uh, appreciate 
everything and all of your time. So I do have just one last question. You know, you mentioned the finance guy uh, and th that's me and that was my prior life. Um, and, you know, you're the IT and, and security guy. We are both of our roles per se are infamous for being, you know, saying no with regard to new technology, innovative technology. For someone in the audience who's trying to implement something new, whether it be a clinician or a startup, you know, what can they do? You know, in, in my world, we've always, you know, talked to them about bringing in the people in the financial suite earlier, helping them understand, helping them validate assumptions with people we've worked with, helping them, you know, show up, uh, you know, what's behind their ROI calculations. What can they do in your world to help get, you know, away from the, oh, they just want to say no? You're like my arch nemesis, by the way, on the financial <laughs> <laughs> I have not forgotten. Um, I, I think the big question is, <coughs> excuse me, a everybody in finance wants to see an ROI, right? Cybersecurity generally is always a sunk cost that you're not going to get back. So it's not just going to them early. It's understand, like I would go to my CFO all the time and I still do and say, how do you want to see the ROI? Does it have to be monetary based ROI? Or is there any other way that I can actually show you? How can I present this to you in a way that makes sense on what we're spending the money on, right? It's also becoming increasingly important for us to understand the shift between CapEx and OpEx right now, because historically it was always CapEx. They can, you know, the Jeffs of the world can depreciate all the money that I'm spending over time. <laughs> That's becoming increasingly difficult to do. So it's really go find out, hey, you know, Miss CFO, when you're running your business and your organization, how are you allocating money? And can I go ask for money from my partners outside of cybersecurity and IT? That, that's great. Well, thank you, Marty. Thank you, Carolyn, for your patience with some of my questions. Um, I, you know, Marty, this has been wonderful. Really appreciate your time. I will put in a little bit of a plug, Marty. We did do a session in terms of you know, both the tangible and intangible ways to look at ROI. We did a webcast with Redox called Measuring and Delivering the Value in Health Tech. And I highly suggest people take a look at that because that can help with some of those ROI questions um, with your CFO. But Marty, thank you so much. This has been terrific. Uh, really appreciate your time. Um, and, uh, you know, really, uh, it's just been a, a terrific hour. Yeah, thank you guys. Thank you everybody for joining as well. It's been fun. Thanks so much, Marty. Take so care. with that, we are going to go ahead and start to wrap up. Uh, I'd love to thank uh, Carolyn for, uh, you know, helping us find Marty, Marty for his time. Um, you know, uh, thank you all for joining us. Thank you very much for your questions. Um, you know, please do feel free to reach out to us on LinkedIn. Uh, you can find us at, at Healthcare Bullpen, obviously the folks at Redox. Um, I am going to direct you folks to a presentation we did recently called Defining and Delivering Value-Based Care, um, which is on our website, uh, healthcarebullpen.com. We'd like you to think of us as the Rosetta Stone between uh, the cultures of technology and healthcare and help you improve how you deliver um, healthcare and technology value to your clients. Next week, we'll have Sherry Galid, uh, who is the Dean of the Wagner, uh, Wagner School at uh, NYU of Public Service. And she's going to talk about trends in healthcare spending and uh, how some of the Medicare spending is actually coming in lower than expected. And with that, I will turn it into turn it over to Carolyn um, to close us out. All right, great. Subscribe to Diagnosing Health Tech on every pod podcast platform or just get uh, reminders for the live show. Um, we'll, uh, let's see if we can get the QR code pulled up um, on the screen. Yes, uh, scan this QR code on the screen, get weekly invites to the show. Um, our show is also sponsored by Redox. We're the healthcare integration platform that specializes in the implementation of big data, AI, and cloud computing um, from all of us at Diagnosing Health Tech. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.